Welcome everybody. We are excited to have you here. We're going to give everybody just a minute to get into the room and get situated. As everybody's kind of coming in for the webinar to get started, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to use the chat feature or the Q&A. I will be posting the handout in the chat here in just a few minutes once we get everybody in. Um, with that, we're really excited to have you here. I'm Missy Gilliland, the Director of Learning Development here at Symmetry. Um, we're excited to have you here and, and everybody's getting joined in and I can see audio is getting in. So I'll just put a quick reminder, if you have any questions or need anything during the webinar, please don't hesitate to use the chat. Um, and if you have questions, please use the Q&A. And if we have time, we'll get to them at the end of the presentation. And if not, um, we will certainly um, email back out and make sure we get your questions answered. With that, let me tell you a little bit about who we are. Symmetry is a company that has a lot of uh, roots and, and a long legacy of experts throughout uh, the various fields in both behavioral and post-acute. Um, we service um, industry-wide. So Chris, I don't know if you wanna move on to the slide where we can kind of pinpoint some of the industries that we we help, we are a company with deep roots. We have um, we help behavioral health organizations across the 50 United States. We work in home health, hospice, palliative, private duty. We do um, our company can help you on a wide spectrum, including uh, recruiting and uh, talent acquisition. So if you're looking for placements, we can help you there. We have RCM. Um, we have consulting services, um, EHR selection. So anything that you need, we can help you with. So with that, I'm really glad you guys could all join us. I'm going to turn it over to our experts, Dana and Chris, to get us started. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Missy. Um, going to just uh, give you a little brief history about my um, introduction to AFIA and kind of how we've gotten uh, started with the, kind of our progression through um, analytics. Um, my uh, relationship really began with them about seven years ago after we had transitioned to a new electronic health record. And um, we were very, we're struggling to get the most out of our purchase. Um, and a CFO colleague from a similar uh, organization kind of introduced me to AFIA. And we uh, just together uh, got started, hit the ground running, started customizing, you know, our configuration to produce, you know, clean claims, because um, that was really important at the, at the time. Um, but that led to KPI reporting and then soon after dashboards of all varieties um, focused on financial or uh, and clinical statistics. Um, and today that data, you know, via the dashboards provides insight to where we've been, uh, where we are today and where we're going in the future. Chris? Right. Yeah, it's been a it's been a good run for uh, we, we were just talking about how time has no meaning anymore. Um, and it feels like we just started working together yesterday, but yeah, I think it was 2015 maybe. So, um, so hey everybody, I'm Chris Akerley. I'm co-founder and managing partner of FIA, which is a symmetry company. And uh, so I've been in the in the industry doing electronic health record selection, implementation, uh, data analysis reporting for the last 15 years. Before that, I was in the financial services world. Um, so my my company, my my history and the company's history are kind of intertwined. Um, uh, we're really excited to talk today about uh, our, our work with data. And so the main thing we wanted to um, communicate with everybody and talk through is learning some key concepts about a data-driven team. Uh, we invited Dana to join because her, she herself and her team are, are ex uh, wonderful examples of customers that have, have gotten to a place where they are data-driven. And they started that journey even before they started working with us. And, and it's all kind of been a progression. Um, so Dana's got wonderful history and stories about what it takes to build a data-driven team. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about some of those secrets. Um, so we'll start by defining the problem and doing these intros. We'll, we'll start narrowing in. You know, what the secret is kind of about people, and so we'll we'll dig in deep on that. A few keys to success, and then we'll leave some time for Q and A at the end. So just setting the stage, then, um, what. What's really important to, to note about all of this is that it, there's really just more to, when you say data-driven or using data, there's just more to it than technology. A lot of times folks will just go right to 
dashboards or reports or whatever it is, the data, right? Um, but there's there's more to it than just that. And and there's some great research on this. There's a, a woman named Mary Lippitt who did some research on like um, complex change. Um, and she's kind of taken each of these areas and said, well, what happens if you don't have one of these pieces in place? Like, can you actually make the change you want? Um, but you'll see technology, it's in there. You know, there's it's important. The data is important. But if you don't have the governance components in place and making sure that everybody understands why you're doing this, you'll you'll have certain kinds of problems. If people don't have the skills or um, you know the the right um, expectations, you can get problems there around resistance and with processes. You can if you if you don't have those well defined and consistent, you get inconsistency. Technology, um, if that's not working well, then people can blame all the problems on technology and ignore the people and process issues. And then if you can't execute it, then then you've got another um, crop of problems. And so if any one of those pieces is missing, then you'll have less success being um, data driven. And so what we want to focus on today, though, is really that people component. Um, so this statement that I've got on the screen here, your organization won't be effective using data unless the people in your organization are effective using data. That sounds simple, may even sound obvious, um, but I can't tell you how many times it's overlooked. You know, it's, it's a thing where you know, just get the tools out there and, and people will use it. Um, but you've really got to engage people with wanting to use the data to do something in the real world. Um, and the other great thing about focusing on people is that you can start doing this today. Um, you don't need to implement some software for it. You don't need to form a committee to discuss processes and things. You can just start engaging with folks differently. Um, and, and that's, we hope to provide a few tools that you can think about your team um, about how to do this. Is the reality is this isn't Field of Dreams. If you just build it, they won't necessarily come. Um, you really need to interact with people based on where they're at. And we're, we're gonna talk about some personalities um, that can help you not do a one size fits all um, for everybody. And if you can start doing that, if you can get those five areas in place, if you can get people engaged, you can have the right tools, you'll see that it can be transformational. So you, you might start with just collecting data and just cleaning up the data and making sure it, it, it sort of works. And, and you know, individual systems, your electronic health record, your GL, they've all got their reports and just get the data into those systems and pull it out. And then maybe you start considering a data warehouse where, well, let's pool that stuff together. We can now ask questions and get answers we never could before because we're looking across systems. And then you move into business intelligence where you start having some metrics and you're seeing how you're doing against your goals, but maybe you can't take action on them just yet. And then the pinnacle of all this is performance management where you've got all the data, it's all together in a place where you want it. People see and understand how they're doing against expectations. And when they get out of line, you can actually go take action on it. So that's Dana's team is an amazing uh, example of that. So Dana, if you wanted to give um, your, your example around productivity, I, I think that's a, just a fantastic evolution. Yeah. Um, yes, data can be very transformational. And, you know, one example of that in my organization was around capturing productivity uh, data to pay an incentive to performers who were kind of going above and beyond uh, the base expectation. And I'm not sure about your organization, but in mine, productivity might as well be a four letter word. Um, because it is the, it is the, um, it's the thing that no one wants to talk about um, and everyone wants to just kind of glaze over. Um, however, because we were paying this incentive, we wanted to make sure that we had dashboards so that I, our staff could see where they were all throughout the month. Um, so there was no surprises. Um, and, you know, that level of transparency between the corporate management, the local clinical management, um, you know, and the employee themselves was a huge part of our success. Um, you know, we've had multiple iterations now of that dashboard now to where, you know, it started as a very qual uh, quantitative, you know, um, look to now we add in quality and uh, also like our strategic plan initiatives. Um, so we really advanced this and moved it forward. So we started somewhere, but we definitely improved and made, you know, made improvements in the process over time um, that we couldn't, have, we couldn't have gotten to step three on day one. We just had to start with kind of that quantitative look. Um, but it's definitely transformed our organization. Yeah, and one of the coolest things I heard about it as you all went through that process is, you know, productivity, four level word, as you said. Um, and one of the, the great, I'll, not necessarily a byproduct, it's part of what you all were trying to accomplish, but 
not only did uh, productivity increase, but the staff, I think, actually staff really liked it, right? Because mm -hmm. they started seeing their own compensation increase as a result of it, which um, I think I heard about that, you know, months after we had sort of rolled things out. And it was so great to hear that it was, you know, it was having this impact on people. And I think that also helped get them engaged and mm -hmm. using the data. So that uh, just, that one's a fantastic example. Um, so, yeah, so like I said, there, there, the, it could be a whole conversation, those five areas. Um, we really wanted to focus in on people for the reasons I mentioned. You know, you, you don't need to go get budget approval to go talk with people different. You can just go um, enact this right away. And we're just going to kind of park on this slide for a bit because this, if you you walked away with, with nothing else from this whole presentation, the idea that it's more than just technology to be data-driven, and then this is really the thing that, that we find helpful. When you go to engage with somebody and talk about data, if you if you don't apply a one size fits all, if you don't just drop data in their lap and assume that they'll just go do something with it, um, then this can be really a, a key concept and really helpful. Because if you're a, you know down the bottom, we see data denier. Those folks are not. They're never going to just go take the data and run with it. Whereas the data native people at the top, yeah, just give them data and they'll just go make sense of it themselves. Um, so we're going to just spend a little time on this slide going through what does it mean for each one so you can kind of apply these labels and, and think about your teams or your individuals. And, um, you know, Dana's got some great examples of folks, um, you know, uh, that where, where she's seen examples of this in the, in the real world. And we're just going to spend a, a good chunk of time talking through what these look like. We have other materials around, well, if you've got yourself a data denier, what, I don't know, how do you move them up the, the chart? Um, is that, I think that's a key concept as well, as it is possible to, to transition between these layers. You're not just like stuck with one and then you'll stay there forever. Um, so, so I'm going to start with the, the data denier. So this, this is your data skeptic. This is the person who... Every time you roll out some data, the data's wrong. Even when it's right, it's wrong. Even when it's proved to be right, it's wrong. Um, data can't do anything for them. We don't know why we're looking at the data. Um, you know, just all, all of those those kinds of uh, pushback that you you may have heard. Um, yeah, and so Dana, you're going to talk a, a little mm -hmm. bit about about how that happens in your organization. If you want to. Definitely. So, um, you know, we really did a lot of testing as we were creating our dashboards, you know, to, to make, you know, to validate the data, uh, to make sure that we were getting good results. Um, so once we did that and we rolled it out to everyone, if someone reported an error, um, they didn't believe the number was correct or whatever, the, the, what I would do is just quickly try to get to the source of the problem. Often it was because something was entered incorrectly in the EHR. It's like the, the dashboard was doing its job, it was just there was bad data um, to start with or no data, like maybe it was a blank field or something like that. So as, uh, as soon as I could get to the, you know, the, to the issue to say like, no, it wasn't, you know, the dashboard or our setup, it's really back to the data, you know, integrity of the, of the missing information. Then I think the shorter the amount of time between when somebody reported this to where you solve the issue and it can be fixed and everybody could see that the data was correct, like that's, I think, imperative to get people to buy in because if someone, you know, you don't want them spreading the word that they saw that the dashboard was incorrect because that's just going to spread like wildfire. <laughs> and of course, when it gets corrected, that's not going to spread nearly as fast or, you know, um, that they they see that happening. So, so that was definitely some tool that I used because I really wanted to make sure that people felt like when they saw the data on the dashboard that it was correct. And um, so I wanted to, you know, do everything I can to foster um, kind of the you know accuracy of the dashboards. Yeah, yeah, and then so you know once you get folks kind of past that data denier stage, you know, maybe there's some curiosity forming, and at that stage, at the data curious stage, people really do they've developed a genuine interest in using the data. It's just that they're not, <laughs> and a lot of times the the rationale there is there's just always something else going on. Like I really want to do it, but I'm too busy. I, you know, there's a genuine um, interest in, in in using the data and making decisions with it. They just can't quite find the time. They they think it'll help them, but they're not sure. But they're they're clearly not convinced enough to go spend the time and um, and and you know work with the data and figure out the data. Oh. Yeah, so I know, yeah, Dana, I, I know you had somebody in your organization who, who 
had some experience with that. <laughs> exactly. And I think one of the things is some people feel like, how can I fit all this in? How can I do more? Um, and actually, it's like you might be doing a little bit more on the front end because you're trying to learn the system and learn where things are. Um, but what we've seen over time is that the people who are really curious about data, once they really are you know, invested in it, a lot of the processing time and other report gathering and things that they previously did, now with the dashboards, all that time kind of, it, it gets turned into more analysis time. And so, you know, that's like way more beneficial to our organizations, right? If somebody's looking at, you know, doing analysis on the data versus just kind of trying to put it all together. Um, and so it's like, it, sometimes it does seem like it's a little bit more for the data curious people, but really it's that once they're kind of invested, they'll see that the processing time is just totally decreased and they have more time to, you know, use the data, work on more interpretive, you know, uh, type things uh, for the organization, which is a lot more beneficial. Yeah. Yeah. And the stat that's always, I mean, it was probably four, three years ago that I heard the stat is that. You know, that's a, and Dana's team really started with data a, a long time ago, just whatever they could with the resources they had at their disposal. Uh, but to do that, you know, they had a nice set of KPIs and things they were looking at. But in order to make that thing go, somebody was spending 40 hours a month putting all that stuff together. And that, that person was probably more of a data native, data enthusiast, but they had to spend all that time getting it together. And, and now it's it just, you know, that that's sort of gone away and they can really focus on it, which then I think other people were able to start moving up the chain um, uh, when there was just less of that time. So, yeah, mm -hmm, definitely. Yeah. And so then that, you know, once you get through that curiosity, people have spent the time, they see like, oh, okay, I, you know, I do have some time because I'm swapping out, um, a, you know, data gathering and just sort of busy work time for actually analyzing the data and I'm able to make decisions faster and you know I'm seeing these benefits. Now you start getting to the data dabbler um, who are, you know, now they're working in the data a little bit. It's it's coming together. They're, they're starting to see it. Um, one of the things we can experience with the data dabbler is they don't really understand the data. Um, you know, it's like, you know, Dana is somebody at her organization that understands the data backwards and forwards. What are all the, the billing codes and the modifiers and how does that impact? And Dana's the CFO, but she also understands the clinical impacts and the those kinds of things. Um, and so she can do this really well. Yeah, I'd say Dana's probably data native to uh, the top of the pyramid here, but the, but the data dabblers, maybe they you know they, they would go and say, well, I built, you know, I'm in there, I'm, I'm working with the data. Um, but maybe they don't understand the difference between like an accounting period date and a date of service and a date of the claim and a date of, a, you know, there, there's all these nuances that you start getting into that if you really want to dig into the data, you've got to take some time and understand that that nuance to be really sharp with it. Um, so data dabblers in there, they, they're dabbling, right? They're, they're touching the data, they're looking at the data, but they're sometimes coming to incorrect, in, incorrect conclusions because they've not fully understood it. Um, and I know, Dan, you've got some examples of those as well. Yeah, so with a data dabbler, what I love to do is just kind of get on a Zoom and work with them side by side. And, and potentially, we're both just building kind of, a, you know, kind of taking the dashboard and filtering things in a certain way uh, to get, you know, the information that they want. And what I like to do with them is just like, let's do this together. And do we get the same result? It's very gratifying to the person, you know, when it's like, hey, our numbers match like this, you know, we applied the same filters, we got to the same, you know, end result. And I think that just builds confidence. And then they're just more equipped the, the next round, you know, to try it on their own. And sometimes they'll do it on their own and then just, hey, did you get, would you get the same result? This is what I'm looking for. Um, and I think that just builds confidence and just helps that person, you know, be um, move up the chain um, in their, you know, data personality uh, to, to reach the top. You know, that's, um, you know, not everyone's going to get there, um, but data dabbler are people who um, with, I think, the, the right um, amount of, you know, coaxing and whatever, they can get there because uh, they're invested enough in wanting to know the information. Yeah. Yeah. And then at that point, now folks are getting this confidence. They understand the data better. They can get consistent results. Um, so they're, they're, now they're, they're a data enthusiast. And so, you know, we might all be enthusiastic about, about data. You, you probably wouldn't be on the line if you weren't enthusiastic about data. But the data enthusiast, though, is they are 
making data a part of their their life on a regular basis. They're good champions. They're talking about how, how what they get out of it, but they might just spend more time looking at data and they haven't quite figured out how to act on the data yet. So uh, they're, you know, again, they're, they're, they're great advocates. They're, they're, yeah, and, and they can work the dashboards and the reports and they can go find things and all that stuff. It's just, you know, if you think about that, that organizational grid from data collection to warehouse to business intelligence to performance management, they're more at the business intelligence um, stage and they haven't quite gotten to that performance management stage yet. Um, so yeah, so those, those are great champions to have, but you still have some work to do to, to get to that, that data native place. Um, and then, so for the for the data natives, um, now it's now we're getting to those folks that are. It's just it's a second it's a second language for them. It's you know I like to use the analogy of it's like driving a car and using the steering wheel and the gas pedals. Like they're just making decisions and using the tools in front of them to um, to just control you know just steer and 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 move in the right direction. You know, these are things like we use data a lot in our world, our, our lives, and we don't even know it, whether that's like checking the weather data so that we know what to wear. We were just talking about how odd the weather was for, for Missy, um, right? It's like you, you might go out in a parka here in Michigan because you think it's April and it's going to be cold, but it's 80 degrees out there. And so certainly the sun helps me understand that, but I also checked my, my weather and I, I just made a decision. It's not like I thought, oh, I'm looking at data now. Let me make a data-driven decision. Mm -hmm. I just use the app and, and just move forward. So that's really where, you know, we'd love to get as many people as possible in the organization. And that's when things start, you know, you're not spending a lot of time talking about the data and getting people to use the data. They're just using the data. They're, you know, finding um, patients and consumers that haven't been served in a certain number of days and they're doing outreach to them. They're, you know, seeing what Compliance measures are out of whack. They're looking at productivity. And it's just a part of what they do. Um, and, and just they make decisions off of it as they go. So, and Dana, I can't remember if you had an example of that one. You are an example of that one, but you might not want to talk about yourself. Um, <laughs> did you have an example for that one? <laughs> um, well, yeah. I mean, I'll say I love it. And, and I do mm -hmm. feel like I have been somewhat the champion of this. Um, I don't know, just by default, um, perhaps, but I really do enjoy, um, I'm really passionate about data. I am um, very passionate about what does something mean? What is this telling me? What is happening? Um, and, you know, for me, whatever, I, I definitely am the champion of this for my organization. And I think that's important to try to find that person in your organization. It may not be your CFO, but there's somebody in your organization that is very passionate about this. Um, you know, what I do, you know, I feel like um, in healthcare, people, you know, in clinics and, and uh, all of your whatever residential, whatever site you're in, what is the most pressing thing to take care of is whatever is happening right in front of you. And so I understand that in clinics, you know, the data is probably the last thing that anyone's thinking about. Um, but when we have those opportunities to have meetings and someone says, I wish I knew, or I wish I uh, could see something, you know, I'll try to create something for them uh, because it doesn't take me very long to just kind of slice and dice the data down into their, you know, their area to show them what they're kind of interested in and what they're looking for. And because I've been that champion, it's like, I I see, you know, that is building people's, um, you know, at least to be curious, you know, maybe to be da a dabbler, you know, to, at least to to incentivize them in some way because it's telling them something that is going to make their clinic better. Um, and so, if I can, if I can know what that is, um, and you know, just kind of help them, then that's I try to do that. Um, you know, just any opportunity that I have, because I think that will just make everyone want to use the data more. Great. Okay. All right, and I'm watching the clock here. I see that uh, we've got about six minutes left. But so really quickly though, there is technically a sixth personality that we run into and it's data codependent. Um, so somewhat similar to the data enthusiast where they're only looking at data, This, but this person can't make a decision without the data and maybe they hunt for too much data and sometimes just enough data is good enough. Um, and so, so just look out for this. I will say that, 
Uh, the other thing to think about is while change is possible up, there's also the possibility to revert. It's not just a linear thing and like, oh, I've, you know, I've, I've gotten my badge and now I'm this. <laughs> you know, you might bounce back and forth. I personally probably go data native to data enthusiast. Like maybe I'm like, why am I even looking at this data? What am I going to decide off of it? Data native. And then I spent some time in data codependent. So um, so just be on the lookout for that. You know, it's 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 going to flow just, you know, just because you have a data denier who becomes um, somebody who's curious doesn't mean they're not going to go right back to data denier when they're busy. So just be on the lookout for that. Um, so we just want to do a quick poll um, for the folks on the line. Uh, which which data personality either fits you or your team or, you know, uh, maybe let's say your team uh, as as the poll comes up. So this isn't graded, so take your best guess. We'll give everybody just yeah, right. <laughs> a few seconds here. So <clears throat> we, uh, we're we going to use the data to go fact check this later. Um, <laughs> talk about data codependent. Absolutely. So, all right. Excellent. We'll give another five seconds or so. So if you're trying to determine your answer, get it in. <clears throat> Wonderful. I'm going to go ahead and close this out. So. We've got a little bit of, of everywhere, Chris. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. But that's interesting though. No data deniers. I'm actually either folks just didn't want to label, use that label, um, or that's that's really interesting. That's that's great. Um, that's a wonderful place to start because that takes a takes a decent amount of energy and you gotta do a lot of work for those folks. So so that's lovely. Appreciate that. Thank you all. All right, so some quick keys to success, and then we'll we'll try to have a, a couple of minutes for questions. But um, really, just making sure that you start somewhere. You know, it doesn't have to all be perfect. You just get started. It just hands-on experience with the data. You just want to get some consistency so that people are are building habits. You know, this is just a new thing for people, and you want to make sure that some sort of pattern. It doesn't have to be every day, but you know, once a quarter, once a month, once a week, something like that, where you've got this habit that you expect people to do. You can build that complexity over time. Dana talked a lot about that. And you just wanna make sure that the data is part of your culture though. So like Dana, as she said, will bring the data up in meetings and things. So it's like, there's an expectation that if you're in those conversations, the data is gonna be a part of the conversation. Um, and then just making it easy to ask questions. You don't, you don't, you wanna have sort of a no wrong door for this um, to make sure that, that, um, things are just smooth and easy. Uh, you, you know, if already somebody's maybe reluctant or doesn't have time, you don't want to make it even harder for them. Um, yeah, Dana, I think, did you have something you wanted to add to this? I think you have said it all. <laughs> all right, <laughs> sounds good. We'll keep on rolling then. We'll have, we'll have a minute for questions. So, so just really quickly in summary, data actually has to be used to be useful, right? If <laughs> we just put a bunch of data out there and there are no human beings looking at the data and working with it, then what was the point of it? So you got to really make sure you work with your teams, you understand where they're at and, and provide them with the support they need based on where they're at. Um, <clears throat> you know, there's more to it than just reports and dashboards. And I'll leave it at that. You'll have this slide up. You, you, you can read the words. Uh, but I want to make sure we've got at least got two minutes here for questions if there are any. And um, so we, we appreciate your time and we'll, we'll see if there's any questions. And if you have any questions afterwards, feel free. Here's our contact information if you want to reach out on anything we talked about. But, Missy, have you been getting questions? Do you have some? We don't have a question. We just had a, a comment that this was great information. So um, we appreciate that. We, we hope you guys enjoyed the presentation. If you do have questions, please reach out to Chris or Dana. Mm -hmm. um, Oh, um, suggestions for managers who have clinicians that are threatened by data. So do you guys have any suggestions? I know, Dana, you had encountered that. Chris, I know you've seen that too. Definitely, we don't use it in a threatening way. It's always, we start in a place of, well, this is what it is, and you know, we can do better, right? It's, um, it's not used in a threatening way or punitive way necessarily, um, but it is a it is a place to start with. How do we improve? What steps do we need to take? Um, you know, I've seen some a bad example of this as well. It's like, wow, our data improved so fast and over such a short period of time, and that wasn't making sense to me. Um, and then I realized that we changed a process that it was inherently 
giving us better data, but not as accurate. Um, and it was really with like call intake. And basically if someone couldn't, you know, uh, we would offer an appointment and if they couldn't, you know, come to that appointment within the next three days or whatever, instead of going on and scheduling them out farther, um, we would, uh, our helpline was uh, schedule, just telling them to call back in in three or four days when it was getting closer to the time that they could come in so that we could shorten this window of time for call, you know, uh, call in to an appointment. And obviously that was not the intent. That's not what we wanted to do. I was like, we got to stop that right away. We need to give, you know, everyone the appointment that's going to work for them um, and not require them to call back in for another appointment because we want to shorten the time frame. Um, so just be aware that things like that can happen. Um, and so just really pay attention because if you make vast improvements over something that you feel like it was going to take a, a long time to move the needle on and you just all of a sudden it starts improving, you really need to look into that a little bit more. A little suspicion, yeah. And then yeah, and I'll just, the quick thing I'll just say is, is we just say people like this with great power comes great responsibility. Like you've got this data now, don't hold it over people's head. It's not a weapon. Um, you, you really need to treat it with respect and, and make sure you come to people with positivity and trying to support them. That's our big thing. Absolutely. And there was another question about uh, ramifications for people that are uncomfortable with that accountability um, that comes with increased mm -hmm. data. Um, I, I think this is a great question and we could follow it up in an email if that works for you, Chris. Yep. Either way, I mean, I, I know if people have to drop, I can like answer the question now and then we can okay, go we'll ahead. have it on the, re the recording as well. We, we can also follow up our email. So I know we're losing some folks. So thank you all if you have to, to drop it. Appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> so I will just say that, um, you know, I, I think a lot of the way that we've we've supported people in that is just kind of tying it back to the mission. You know, we, we work with a lot of mission driven organizations and the idea that, <clears throat> yes, you may personally be held accountable and but isn't that a good thing like don't it means that if the accountability is around getting people in for appointments don't we want people to come in for their appointments you know if the accountability is around serving as many people as you can isn't that why we're here to try to serve you know so trying to do that in as positive a way and tying it back to why are we even here doing this it's not for the data it's not it's not like we're here to watch a scoreboard of a number of days from a call to first appointment we're here to serve people and get them in the door. So if we're all working together about how do we use the data to show us that something's off with that because it's taking us three weeks and we really want it to be within 10 days, um, like how, how can we all be on the same team about that? It's not about you necessarily, it's about the, the bigger mission. That's that's proven pretty effective because it's from, you know, it's it's genuine. <laughs> so data, I don't know if you've got any other thoughts, but that, that's probably been the most effective. There's certainly other techniques, but that's probably been number one. Definitely. Yes. And, you know, when you're looking at data, you're not usually looking at a one off example because um, you're, you're looking at more aggregate over, you know, a large, um, you know, a large span of data, not just like one example. So I think that's important as well. Yeah. And, and actually, one other thing, too, is we also try to use the data to help people be more accountable. So it's we 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 may start with the sort of after the fact you know well what happened last quarter and now i've got the numbers but we really want to move that to so maybe the data comes goes from being well you know 50 percent of the time we got appointments within 10 days last quarter to hey here are the people who called and they're at you know five days or four days and you know countdown reports and you're really being able to um launch people into action to, to to do those things that we've all kind of agreed are the right things to do. So how do we how do we do that so that the data is actually informing them and helping them meet that accountability, not just telling them what they did right and wrong you now when it's too late to do anything about it. So that's that's really an important one is let's let's allow people to take action where they can. Excellent. Great information, Chris and Dana. Thank you both so much. Um, thank you all for joining us today. We will be sending out um, a recording of this to you in the next 72 hours, so look for that in your email. As always, thank you for joining Symmetry. Dana and Chris, thank you again for your time and your expertise. It was a great webinar. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Have a great day, everybody.